Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to everyone present here today and a very warm welcome to NMIMS Bengaluru. It's a special day today. 108 is considered a sacred number. It's considered the basis of all creation. And we are all gathered here today for the 108th session of the Lawyers' Roundtable Conference. It's a special day because we have amongst us Mr. J. Sai Deepak, a man who does not really need an introduction, and Mr. Prasanna Mysore, who has several accolades to his credit. We welcome you both to NMIMS Bengaluru. It's a special day also because NMIMS Bengaluru is the first educational institution to be hosting the Lawyers' Roundtable Conference. This comes at a time when our first batch is entering the last leg of their degree and is just one step away from graduating in 2024. Without further ado, I invite Mr. J. Sai Deepak, Mr. Prasanna Mysore, and our Deputy Director, Dr. Narayani Ramachandran, to kindly light the lamp for an auspicious start to today's session. I request you to kindly be on stage, uh, sir. Um, I would like to invite Mr. Riklavya, Director of Placements, to kindly present a token of welcome from our side for our guests.
Thank you, sir. As I mentioned in the beginning of the day today, Mr. Prasanna Mysore dons several hats. He has served as the general counsel to major corporates, including LNT and Aditya Birla Group, is an accredited arbitrator, an independent director, corporate law consultant, trainer, and speaker. And for School of Law, NMIMS Bengaluru, he is also our friend, guide, and mentor. Mr. Prasanna founded the Lawyers' Roundtable, or the LRT as it is more popularly known, in 2014. And as they say, persistence will get you there, but consistency will keep you there. So n nine years and 107 sessions later, the LRT continues to thrive as a knowledge forum, renowned knowledge forum for lawyers all over the country. I would now like to invite Mr. Prasanna himself to throw more light on the journey of the LRT and to do the honor of introducing the man of the day, Mr. J. Sai Deepak. Sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good to be here for the second time. I think last time I came and had an interaction with uh, the students, it was absolutely, um, took me back many, many years when I was a student of law. When I came back to Bangalore after my 25 year stint in uh, Bombay as a general counsel, I was wondering how could I actually make use of time uh, gainfully. So with the help of two, three other lawyers, we decided why not we have a kind of a round table. And um, I was quite fascinated when more people started endorsing this idea and they started actually supporting the whole thing. So in 2014, it was officially launched and I'm indeed happy that the, we're celebrating the ninth anniversary of LRT with the 108th LRT being conducted here. LRT is, is a free to attend event. It's absolutely no commercials involved. We find a sponsor who will actually host the event. Typically, uh, when we have physical meetings, it is between 12 noon and 2.30, and the sponsor will make a presentation and also host lunch for all the participants. In the 69th LRT, the pandemic struck, but undaunted by that, from 69th to 99th LRT, we started having virtual LRT. We had very, very good speakers from different parts. This is Indu Malhotra, then we had Sham Divan, then we had Dushan Dave, we had so many other well-known lawyers sitting in their chamber and then addressing the participants in different parts of India because it's being live streamed. And uh, mercifully, the pandemic sort of slowed down and the 100th LRT was held and uh, we had the Justice Venkata Chalaya, the former Chief Justice of India, uh, gracing the occasion and talking to us and putting us all to shame that we suffer from severe memory lapse when compared to the kind of recall he had. It was absolutely incredible that he could even re recite from a book which he read 20 years back. Amazing person and a, you know, a person to be revered. F since then, we have been having uh, regular meetings and uh, I'm indeed very happy that uh, we are actually having this here in the educational institution because I'm a lawyer. I was born in a law school and to actually celebrate LRT in a law school is a crowning glory and to have Sai Deepak here with us is absolutely icing on the cake, let me say that. So thank you, Sai, for being here with us. Thank you. As many people would say, 
he doesn't really require any introduction, but it is customary that we say it. And his, his entire CV is put in his own words. So I'm going to actually say it the way he would say it. I practice as an independent counsel primarily before the High Court of Delhi and the Supreme Court of India with bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Anna University and law from, uh, from IIT Karagpur, 2006 and 2009. I began my career as a civil commercial litigator in July 2009 with the NCR-based firm Shri Krishna and Associates and was made associate partner in March 2015. In 2016, I founded the law chambers of J. Sai Deepak, set up an independent practice as a counsel. I am briefed by law firms and solicitors to represent parties primarily before the Delhi High Court, the Supreme Court of India, the NCLT, also appear before the Madras, Telangana, Calcutta, Bombay, Karnataka, and Himachal Pradesh High Court. I would not like, like to read the whole thing because the time with Sai Deepak is very precious. And uh, he has, of course, a time constraint. He has to leave the campus around half past two. So without much ado, I would like to um, invite uh, Sai Deepak to address all of you. The topic that we have given to him is the changing landscape of uh, commercial litigation. But that's not the only thing that he would sort of limit himself to. He's quite open to uh, interacting with you after his formal presentation. You are welcome to ask questions which you think are sort of on top of your mind. Particularly students who are in the management school, you also can understand the kind of business environment and how litigation actually either facilitates or impacts business and what kind of uh, situation you are getting into when you actually embark on your own businesses. So multiple things, you know, Sai Deepak can talk on any subject under the sun and that's the advantage of having a person like him. So ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Sai Deepak. Good morning. So uh, I'll just structure the talk in such a way that I take a maximum of 35 to 40 minutes. And I'll leave the rest for uh, question and answers from the students. Um, I think, just to build on what Sir said, the success of a lawyer is not to know everything under the sun, but to give the impression that he knows everything under the sun while continuing to stick to his areas of competence and comfort. So the interesting part is that uh, my journey has been largely commercial, hardcore commercial. But thanks to my involvement in certain constitutional matters, fortunately or unfortunately, most people get the impression that I'm actually from the other end of the spectrum, which is the activity spectrum, which I'm not, remotely. Uh, just so that you get a clear picture as to where this talk is going to come from or where this experience is going to come from. Even as on date about, I'd say, 85% of my cases or the briefs that I appear in are commercial in nature, out of which, out of that 85%, close to 60% is intellectual property, competition law, um, and the rest is about insolvency, Companies Act, uh, I take up arbitrations sparingly because I prefer to go before the court much more than an arbitration, unless and until it is really something that piques my interest. And the rest of the 15% out of the 100% split is devoted to constitutional law, where the bulk of the matters are pro bono in nature towards those causes which I have a particular affiliation for. So that's the broad split. And as part of this particular journey, I've had the benefit of blending two worlds, the forensic commercial world with the constitutional world. And I've benefited from the experience that each of these worlds has to offer. The ability to soar at a 60,000 feet level when I speak of a commercial matter and the ability to get down to the nuts and bolts of it when I speak of a constitutional matter, these are complementary synergies which I've been able to acquire over the, the course of the last 14 years. This July 14th, 2000. 23, I'll complete the 14th year in the profession. And frankly speaking, uh, 
having made the transition from engineering to law, the one thing I'm very, very clear about is, while this is an age of specialization, I would equally say that I would expect the lawyers of the future to have certain broad general skill sets apart from certain core specialized subject matter expertise. That is the way of the future according to me. Because super specialists are bound to find themselves saturated over a point of time. They may not bring much to the table. So I don't know how many people are aware of this uh, this fantastic author on copyright law, Nimmer, David Nimmer. If you were to actually look up his CV and his qualification, try and guess what would his basic strengths be? What do you think he must have done his majors in? Just take a shot. OK. Literally Greek and Latin. Literally Greek and Latin. And from there, for the man to have actually made the switch to IP and specifically specialize in copyright law and also speaks extensively on technology related subjects, it's unbelievable. So the practice in some of these jurisdictions is that every seven years a lawyer is expected to revisit his area of expertise and perhaps make a switch so that you don't suffer from a rut. And there is also a growing, uh, let's say, physical realization or a health-based realization for this. Studies tell us that lawyers are more prone to Alzheimer's. And there's a good reason for this. Because after a point, thanks to your specialization, certain parts of the brain don't function. You stop using them, especially numbers. And in the process, once that particular part of the brain starts going numb, it starts taking a toll on your memory and other aspects as well. So it is actually in your best interest to constantly revisit your specialization and make sure that all parts of your brain work. We are often told that uh, there's excessive emphasis on memory and there needs to be more emphasis on original thinking. That message has been interpreted by the generations after me as lack of need for memory. And I don't think technology is exactly aiding that process. It has actually worsened it. Even I can't remember phone numbers the way I used to 15 years ago. So I think uh, these are certain meta traits which I'm very alive to, particularly as part of practice. Because COVID has done one thing which is brilliant, which is to make us paperless when it comes to arguments. But it has also taken our ability, it has taken away our ability to remember which side of the file on which page number is the document to be found because you're now looking at it serially. You're not looking at it this way or that way. So it has taken a toll on your ability to remember files also. I've seen this personally happen. So anyways, coming back to the topic, thanks to the law school and to Prasanna Garu to actually, for actually extending this invitation. Uh, he's been kind enough to indulge me with the dates of the right kind. And uh, uh, I'm happy to share with you whatever little I know. So here's my suggestion. Treat the opening monologue as merely a primer. And once the Q&A starts, milk this session for whatever it is worth from the perspective of your future. The mistake that you can make, which I'm urging you not to, is to turn this into a forum for public debate on political issues. I'm happy to do so. I'm more than happy to do so because frankly, I'm, I'm happy to defend any of my positions. But every person dons a particular hat before different kinds of audience. So I've come here in the capacity as a lawyer. So you choose what you wish to ask and how do you wish to make sense of this particular session. Do you wish to create a sensationalist YouTube video out of this? The choice is yours. Or do you actually want to go back with a few takeaways which help your career? That's your call. So I'm going to try and stick to the topic as much as possible to make this relevant for you more than for myself. Now coming to the question or the issue of commercial landscape, the changing commercial landscape, I think it's important for me to set out a few caveats and disclaimers so that you know what I know and what I don't. I have zero idea of transactional practice. 
which is I have never been on the contractual side. I have always been on the litigating side. So I have no insights to offer from a transactional persp perspective at all, whatsoever. What I have to offer does not even go beyond the areas of my competence in terms of even litigation abilities. So I'm going to stick specifically to my subjects. I would follow this discipline simply because I think it's important for a person who's speaking on a subject to identify the meets and bounds of what he knows and what he doesn't know so that you know how much of my, let's say, so-called gyan is worthy of extrapolation to other areas. But I will also share general litigation trends. Specifics will be limited to my specific areas of practice. Trust me, this will not be an engagement in Atmastuti where I'll speak about myself, but I have to necessarily draw from my own experience because that's the experience I know best. With these caveats, take whatever I say with a pinch of salt because every journey is extremely unique, especially in the litigation fraternity. No journey is comparable to another because it's a question of the backgrounds that you're bequeathed with, the kind of opportunities that land on your table, which is a function of destiny. And then comes the function of your talent, which is what do you make of the opportunities that destiny has placed on your table? I think these are several factors here. By and large, what I see is there is a decent chance that we may not see mega law firms anymore. They will be forced to break up one way or the other. For the simple reason that the legal market over the world is maturing in terms of asking for boutiques with, uh, let's say, strengths in allied subjects. So for instance, if we were to talk of intellectual property, what are the allied subjects? So the epicenter of the IP practice is obviously IP. But what are the concentric circles that you can draw around this IP, let's say this epicenter? Arbitrations increasingly on the IP side. Antitrust law. And specifically, if you speak of patents within intellectual property, then the regulatory side on the pharma side or the agriculture side. Because that has a huge bearing on your ability to launch a product, your ability to anticipate red flags by way of litigation, and your ability to understand how much do you need to stock in your warehouse if you want to dump your products in the market before you're sued in court to say, product's out, there's no point of recall, I don't have the ability to take the product back. So at the very least, the product that's out in the market needs to be sold. These are the kind of strategic things that you're expected to be aware of. Then the fourth aspect which IP lawyers and super specialists of IP are beginning to realize is their poor understanding of contract law. Because IP lawyers tend to focus heavily on substantive IP and not on the transactional commercial side. And gradually, even litigators who used to be pure IP specialists are beginning to understand contract law better. The reason, perhaps, what I'm trying to point out is some of these silos are gradually being broken as a consequence of industry demands. So the industry wants you to know your area plus certain uh, areas so that you're not forced or they're not forced to go to multiple lawyers for the same transaction. And they want a comprehensive analysis. Otherwise, if you were to send the IP part to the IP guy, the contract part to the contract guy, he's going to speak from his perspective, and this guy is going to limit himself to his universe. And there is rarely a meeting ground between two different areas of practice, unless there is, let's call it, practiced empathy, which is you know what he is saying and why is he saying. And that's not going to happen when the universes are completely different. Now, this also translates to increased expectations of expertise from in-house counsels where they must know how to juggle different areas of practice and different practitioners and must also know how to marry two different opinions coming from two different places. Three, previously people used to go to big law firms because that's the most Googleable law firm. Now it has given way for much more informed referencing. So what is the scale of economies that works between a big law firm and a small law firm? Because a big law firm has multiple streams of revenue, it is capable of undercutting its price for a particular area of practice. 
which makes it difficult for a boutique to compete with it from a price perspective because ultimately it boils down to money fee schedules hourly rates so on and so forth but when they realize that they are actually throwing peanuts and they are bound to get monkeys in return for a particular subject gradually the industry is saying i'm happy to pay an extra buck for value addition when it comes to a particular area this trend i have seen especially during and counterintuitively during the lockdown because you would expect people to go in the direction of much more cost effectiveness during the lockdown because legal budgets were being slashed across the board but they realized that since the complications are much more and you need a much more nuanced opinion which is in tune with both the realities of the subject and what's happening they decided to focus on value addition more than money and the transitions happened three the other side of the equation is that boutiques cannot afford to be hyper specialized boutiques anymore both ways and the best part of the last 5 or 6 years and this is a suggestion that i made when i entered the profession is that very few law firms seem to have academic research centers not just for regulatory affairs but from a policy making perspective so two fantastic developments that have happened at least over the course of the last half a decade or more is mainstream law firms setting up policy units within their own firms and policy specific law firms so previously policy was the the let's say exclusive preserve of think tanks but policy becoming the mainstream preserve of a law firm is a relatively new development so what does this tell you as law students look at the number of avenues that have opened up so should you wish to work on a law firm and be on the policy side you are not limited only to think tanks anymore you can actually look for options here second assuming that you have made the mistake of deciding the kind of specialization that you wish to be a part of in the second year or third year itself i am trying to tell you please don't wait at least until you're done with the sixth semester until then be a generalist it's extremely important for you to be a generalist at least until the sixth semester and use only the last four semesters for specialization and your specialization must also be broad enough in the sense it should be a and plus plus three there is also the downside of the supply perhaps being much more than the demand still and that is a reality in light of mushrooming law schools across the country in general most developed economies who have entered the tertiary stage of economy where the service sector takes precedence over the manufacturing sector are now facing the problem in terms of having too many people who are qualified with softer aspects of qualifications as opposed to the manufacturing side and when that happens two things happen one it artificially inflates the price of a particular service and two not everybody is bound to find value added jobs which means even profiles which don't have actual value addition will be hyped up only to accommodate people because the academy is throwing up way too many people than the industry can accommodate and the one thing that your generation and i say this with responsibility will have to deal with in content basis is the reality of artificial intelligence which is going to render redundant a lot of aspects of legal practice now what does this actually translate to is only serious subject matter experts who are in a position to offer way beyond information and who are actually able to strike a distinction between insight and information will be the ones to find value in the value chain in the long run and with research being reduced to something that ai can do your strength comes not in finding something out but in framing the right question to find something out which is if a particular problem 
is escalated to you for your consideration by a client or anybody else every problem has at the very least more than two layers ai will kill the first and second layer the trick lies in finding out the third layer which ai cannot at least as on date and that layer comes from two aspects if you don't have experience it comes from the depth of your understanding of the subject to identify what is the most fundamental question that you can distill from a problem and if you have experience then those aspects which ai cannot anticipate either by way of commercial realities or litigation realities so there is an interstice or a niche that a fresher can fill and there's an interstice or niche that a person with experience or standing can fill so you will not be competing against your peers you will be competing against ruthless technology which has zero human considerations at play why is this important and here's where the cultural reality becomes relevant by and large even today despite our degrees of liberalization and globalization sentimentality plays a huge role in indian decision making processes the hire and fire policy has not set itself in or entrenched itself in indian culture still and even western organizations who come to this country are forced to deal with those realities to a significant extent now that factor will be significantly offset when the need for your presence in the value chain is reduced by ai altogether when there is no hire where is the fire so what i'm perhaps trying to tell you is try not to pass off fluff and communication skills as insights when it comes to law your bluff will be called out like this actual value addition is what will hold you in good stead in the long term soft skills do matter articulation does matter but more often than not what is being articulated is more important than how it is being articulated because the majority levels of the audience is only it's only going up to i suspect i could be wrong that if ai continues to go down or let's say move or hurtle at this particular speed certain people who wanted to practice law fully may need to have safety nets the biggest side that's going to be affected is not the litigating side but the transaction side those who perform or let's say survive on dd due diligence those are aspects which have translated to huge billables all these years thanks to the number of hours consumed and thanks to the number of people who are put on the bench to perform a particular activity that's where people are going to try and cut it down litigation still has a significant degree of subjectivity involved there's an element of reading the judge more than the law right these soft considerations make it difficult for ai's penetration to be faster when it comes to litigation and therefore perhaps i'm trying to tell you the tent of the courts <laughs> if you really want to survive for multiple reasons litigation forces you to come up with certain inputs which go beyond mere encyclopedic knowledge because it throws up situations it throws up aspects which are related to the procedure or a confluence of procedure and subject substantive knowledge which plain and simple research will never be able to throw up because live realities force you to deal with a lot more let's say permutations and combinations than you can actually think of so if i were in a law school at this particular point of time what is it that i would do i would also focus on creating hardcore tech savvy lawyers not just tech lawyers lawyers who are extremely savvy with technology who are comfortable with it because i suspect that at least 30% of the crowd that flocks towards law schools does so out of fear of numbers and science that can't happen anymore that cannot happen anymore every profession at some point will need to equip itself with coding skills so if i were to actually think of a curriculum for law school coding would be an integral part of legal training second one aspect of 
legal training today which suffers seriously is understanding of economics and econometrics, both being different. I don't think lawyers understand economics as much as they are supposed to, and they certainly don't have the ability to understand econometrics yet. Because law is treated as an extension of soft humanities, and in the process, there is a certain degree of inherent disdain for numbers, unless you are practicing tax law or something else. That needs to go. And why am I making this point? In the realm of civil commercial litigation, especially because we are trying to project ourselves as the go-to place for investment, foreign investment, one of the things that corporations expect is first an active judiciary which is conscious of rights and also a judiciary which is comfortable with a culture of awarding damages, which Indian culture still doesn't. Indian judicial culture does not. There is absolutely no monetary pain that is inflicted on the infringer or someone who infracts someone's rights. And even if it happens, it is largely arbitrary. It's like a tukka. You're just throwing an arrow in the dark. You don't explain how do you rationalize a particular figure that's being awarded for a particular infraction. That doesn't happen enough. I've seen McGregor on damages in libraries across the place, but I haven't seen it being applied in courts at all, very rarely. But gradually that's happening because commercial litigation, which is part of civil litigation, has gained hyper focus thanks to the Commercial Courts Act and setting up of IP divisions. So the expectation is not only speed, but also greater nuance. Greater nuance when it comes to substantive law, greater nuance when it comes to damages. And you can't speak of damages unless and until you're good at two things. Knowing how to establish your right or entitlement to a particular figure. That's only, let's say, the only 50% of that equation is contingent on facts, on actual laws. The rest of it is notional. And when it's notional, you enter the realm of econometrics because you're looking at opportunity loss and valuation. So valuation must also feature as part of your training. So I'm trying to include those aspects as part of your training, which will protect you from the incoming onslaught of AI and still keep you relevant in the market. Three, I benefited from a particular exercise in law school because I'm the product of the first batch of a law school. So I know the teething issues that most people go through if you're the product of a first batch because you're the guinea pigs. You're the jeev or the jantu on which the shodhan is being done. It is the curse of the eldest sibling. As the eldest sibling and also the product of the first batch of a law school, I went through everything possible. So this is where the experience is coming from which is that you're bound to face a lot of competition in mooting circles. You're a nobody, right? Because you don't have an established legacy to fall back on. And brand makes a huge impact even in markings when it comes to mooting circles. Anybody who tells me otherwise is lying. I've been there, I've done that, I know exactly what happens. So what is it that you can do and you should do to stand out when there is an excess of supply, is find a skill that gives you the maximum possible access to the widest possible audience. And there is no substitute for writing till date. If I were in law school, and if I were allowed to interfere with the functioning of a law school, I would focus excessively and extensively on writing for multiple reasons. For two, let me, let me give you the best possible reason. Whether you take a transactional practice or litigation practice, the one thing that's expected of you is to be good on paper. From drafting of advice to, let's say, internal opinions to preparing a research note and whatnot. Close to a year and a half is, spelt, is spent in, let's say, the first years of your training, the first formative years of your training, where people are trying to teach you how to write. It is a tragedy if people have to be taught how to write after coming out of law school that has to be done within law school. At least that skill set must be crystal clear. 
I would actually say writing skills must be in decent place by the time you're done with the 12th because that's the job of the school. Law school teaches you how to write in a particular context, not basic writing. So that has to happen in the law school. And the only way you actually get to reach out and engage it with a wider audience is through publications. And these days, blogs are taking over hardcore publications. So try and acquire these skill sets because it's going to reduce the lead time that you need to become a finished product in the legal industry. Because legal industry is asking itself, how less can I spend on training them? Because once I train them, these smart guys will run to the next opportunity. So I don't want to spend too much of money on training you. And therefore the buck is passed back onto the law school to finish the training aspect. Therefore, I would use the five-year program in a very ruthless way to deliver hardcore skill sets which keep you in good stead, give you the soft skills needed in terms of polish because nobody is going to take an interest in your career once you get out of law school. You're only you take an interest. Nobody has the time to teach and sit and, and walk you through the hoops of the profession. Three is the profession will not give you an opportunity to build a personality. Only law school will. So you need to work on coming out with a personality which makes you accessible, approachable, amiable, and let's use a word, conversable. Two, you need skill sets which reduce the training period required in the industry. Three, there must be some form of channeling in terms of saying, first year this is the width of the nozzle by the time they finish the fifth year they come out with these specific skill sets the mistake that law schools make usually is to try and cater to every possible need of the industry you cannot you should not you will never be able to depending on your internal resources and what you think are your strengths i would actually expect law schools to say i'm going to make sure that at least in this subject i am known as the go-to place for recruitment whether it's civil commercial litigation or criminal litigation or whatever it is, choose that area. And that way you actually, uh, let's say, frame or tailor your curriculum. I understand it, uh, it affects your ability to attract more people. But what is the point of attracting more people if you can't actually place them back in the industry? So the test is not how many people get in, but the test is how many people get out for good reasons. These are certain aspects which I think are crucial because there's no point in talking about realities of the litigation landscape or let's say commercial litigation landscape unless it feed, let's say it loops back to the original channel which is the law school. These changes have to happen in the law school. Four, uh, thanks to institutions of which I'm a product, you're not just competing with five-year integrated programs anymore. There is serious competition from the three-year programs as well, who come with hard skill sets from diverse segments, engineering. Thanks to my law school, now engineers taking up law has become the new normal. And I can take significant credit for it without being immodest or modest about it, 100%. I know of the number of people who made the transition saying, sir, we want to do this. Although that's not what I want them to do. I'm just saying be good at what you're doing. But they have made this transition. So what does that mean? Those areas of practice where there is an expectation of a basic scientific temper or a scientific degree, if you were to compete against them, who do you think is going to be the natural choice for the client? So automatically, certain areas of practice, you will be at number two by default, unless that presumption is rebutted. I'm not saying it is an irrebuttable presumption, but at the outset, it's a rebuttable presumption with a presumption leaning in favor of those with science degrees. That's one of the reasons that certain national law schools wanted to clamp down on third year degree, three year degrees, <laughs> because they wanted to stave off competition. But I don't think that's the way to go about it. There's no point in trying to be relevant by killing competition in that sense. So these are the broad points that I wanted to share with you. Close yours. Feel free to come after me. Go ahead. 
No, my energy is better when I stand, so let them start. <laughs> Sir, if you have a few questions you wanted to ask a few, yes. please. Yeah, yeah, please. Yes. Your area of play as part of this Q&A session is law, legal practice, and uh, I will make room for impact of your public positions on your litigation practice. No problems. I'm open to those questions. Uh, thank you very much, Said Deepak. It's a wonderful speech. I would I, I would prefer to take notes on because uh, I think my students had a treat today. What to do? How the landscape is uh, in front of them. So my question would be in benefit of them. See, you are a person, when you were in IIT Karakpo, you wrote a blog on the merger, which has been cited, had the pride of being cited in the court cases. While I was reading that about the information about you, I was wondering, writing is an important skill that you have also emphasized to my students. If most of them would like to start with a blog and create their digital footprint, will it have a positive impact all the time? Or will it go against them when they are building up their career? Because digital footprint is going to have an impact in their right. career. Right. So if I had started a blog in my own name, it would have fallen flat as a law student. So what I did was to become a part of a brand in the first place. And Spicy IP was a brand by the time I had started writing for it in 2008. I'm not asking people to fall prey to publicity stunts. That is a temptation that you should seriously avoid. I'm asking you to take up academic writing with a lot of rigor. So the go-to portal will continue to be serious publications and journals in the first place. Today, there are enough and more blogs on several subjects. So what is the incentive for people to come and read your blog? Who are you? Blunt question. That question will show you your place. And as a litigator, we know how brutal this question can be in a court of law. So there's no point in jumping to blogs immediately. I'm saying start with academic writing in the most serious way possible, in the old school way possible, because it continues to impose the necessary academic rigor in terms of citations and whatnot. Go through those filters first. Only when you know that you have the ability to subject yourself to enlightened review and that you have something of value to offer by way of original inputs then you make the transition to blogging otherwise blogging is a lazy way out instead of subjecting yourself to academic rigor and all you'll be focusing on is that you look at the traffic data how many people read me today as opposed to asking did I make sense today or not <laughs> yeah. so I'm asking you to Look at this exercise from a priority perspective. The priority is to subject yourself to criticism, not to adulation. And that can't happen if you start with blocking immediately. OK, so if you really want to write, then Indian Corporate Law, that's a great blog. Spicy AP continues to be good, notwithstanding my ideological differences with it. And there are quite a few such, blo uh, let's say, blocks, so to speak. The filtration process there is serious because they have a branch to maintain. Spicy IP continues to be among the foremost blogs that the US Library of Congress continues to look out for, for updates on Indian intellectual property developments. So there, there's a filtration process. There's a brand. There's a quality control. It's important. A portal which does not have any kind of quality control in the name of democratization of opinion is cashing in on your temptation for publicity to push up its ratings and viewings with quality not being the focus. Remember that. Democratization of opinion, if it comes at the quality of opinion, I'm sorry, I'm not happy with democracy. I'm being very blunt about it. I'm interested in quality. I'm interested in rigor. I'm interested in you being told, sorry, you're not up to the mark. That needs to be told as much as possible before you enter the profession as opposed to being told after you enter the profession. Because then you really don't have enough time. Once it starts, it, it flies, time flies. 
Next. Thank you so much. I think they will take note of these points and they will not go behind this number of <laughs> likes and stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, Don't be scared. Go ahead and ask. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Sir. I'll ask a question. I think the students would certainly follow up with other questions. Just one clarification. Yeah. The aggression of my engagement with debaters is different from my aggression of engagement with students. <laughs> so feel free to ask. Next. Yes. You know, when I became uh, a lawyer, young lawyer, um, my father insisted that I start doing uh, the back office work, understand how the court system works, etc. And then, uh, of course, writing was given a lot of importance. We didn't have word processors then. Right. Then it was very important for him to put me to the grind of doing trial work, right. examining witnesses and cross-examining them and all that stuff. Before even he gave me the first appellate matter where I could actually uh, address the judge in a matter which involved an appeal. I'm a bit saddened that in these days students are under tremendous peer pressure. Which law firm is going to recruit you? Which law firm have you joined? Which right. law firm did you intern? Right. All these become severe pressure points and the students are under tremendous pressure. And then everybody wants to go into what is known as a corporate practice, like you said, the transactional practice. Hmm. And uh, the very purpose of Dr. Madhav Menon find founding National Law School send was people to, to courts. send people to courts. Correct. Why has the system failed, and what is the, what should the students do to overcome that particular mindset of sitting in an AC room and not even seeing the court one day? Okay, this is actually going to open the floodgate for a lot of answers. Because uh, there is a trend which I've been noticing, which is sad, obnoxious, and positively vulgar. Which is of people celebrating even internships on LinkedIn. Unbelievably disgusting. Whenever they secure an internship, they start thanking their parents, their families, their gurus, and everybody. It's almost as if they're waiting for an Oscar speech. <laughs> I'm not running you down. I'm saying don't reduce the standards of your own achievement by thinking of an internship as an achievement. No matter how much law firms put you through, let's say, that kind of artificial uh, delusion that securing an internship here is the pinnacle of your achievement. Don't do that. The real world doesn't care. In the process, a serious platform has been rendered to, f I mean, reduced to Facebook. A professional platform such as LinkedIn has become absolute garbage now. So makes it so irritating to actually visit some of these profiles now. Or at least, unfortunately, they end up showing on your wall. You don't want to see them because it tells you of the falling standards in the legal profession at the, at, at the lowest level possible. Two, um, what I've realized also is a falling work ethic, in fact. Because there are too many distractions. And people make the mistake of expecting work-life balance in the first year. Okay, do it. I'm nobody to decide or tell you what your priorities must be. Then don't regret that you're just an also ran after a few years. There's only a threshold to which you will reach. And this is a profession which literally tells you that sky is the limit. You're being given a quarter port Maserati or a Bugatti or a Lamborghini and you wish to run it at the pace of 1984-800 Maruti model. Do it. That, I think, demeans the profession. Two, the sharpest brain 
he's not someone who wants to arbitrate in an air conditioned atmosphere but someone who has been in the trial court and who knows how to raise the right objections and make your life miserable before you get to your next point if you don't understand the value of that take it from someone who's done all of those who's jumped all of those hoops i say this with no disrespect to anyone and to any law firm culture but a well trained second year litigating associate can make a mince meat of corporate partners from the best of law firms in courtrooms within seconds it starts with the way you address the court it starts with your body language it starts with your pre preparation on procedural aspects the sharpest of creatures is someone who's mastered the registrar's courts when it comes to cpc he is the one to look out for or she is the one to look out for or they are the one to look out for depending on what pronoun you subscribe to 3 so when i wanted to make the switch from engineering to law aerospace engineering was my goal after having completed the mechanical engineering because the the analogy at at home or the simile that they played out was mechanical engineering is like rice mix it with anything because i couldn't get score enough for aerospace so i had to settle for mechanical in the hope of pursuing a masters so when i made this jump from aerospace to law it was literally a fall from the sky in the eyes of my family so there's a very popular bridge in hyderabad sorry bhagnagar uh, it's called the chikarpalli bridge so on the bridge what is it actually famous for apart from actually being one of the arterial bridges for the city is that touts and louts from the legal profession mismatch footwear hercules cycle my parents actually thought that would that's what i'd be doing this this is what you want to do after actually aspiring for aerospace engineering you you spoke of werner von braun abdul kalam what is this let me tell you those touts and louts are the ones who make it possible for people to actually have a dignified place within the jail ecosystem by the way because if you have to survive in an indian jail with your dignity intact i am sorry no supreme court lawyer will come and save you they can't they will not be in a position to because the reality of that place requires a different creature altogether so every place has its let's say its own solutions and the worth of a solution is not you don't judge it on the basis of its pedigree but on its efficacy in a given environment so a lot of times people come and tell me sir why didn't you go to this court and argue i said i'm useless in that court they don't even know who i am why will i go and argue there immediately because they, they are not calling me because of subject matter expertise they'll call me because they think i have face value there i said i have zero face value there you want me to come and turn it around for a different reason i'll do it but if you think i have any face value there no because each of those courts will have their own dons and you have to respect their positions there that's how the profession works the one thing that this profession does not withstanding your balloon versions of your egos your dignities and whatever it, it is to teach you humility will show you exactly your place in the ecosystem see this is where you stand respected one way or the other three most people who are very good at having done trial law and who have let's say mastered the nuances of procedure their levels of confidence when it comes to arguments when procedure meets substantive law is of a different order altogether if you what do you think ultimately after a point the legal profession survives on it's not just your recognition in let's say before foreign clientele but will people in the registry know oh if this man comes or this person comes he knows what exactly he is doing you cannot fib or faff around him he knows where the file is stuck he knows what is the problem with the objection because he has done this he has been there he has seen all of this this profession will open up doors in the most perfumed of atmospheres but not without having gone through the grime 
don't avoid that learning curve. And to answer your question on the corporate side and entry into litigation, I respect every master of their own universe, which is to say someone who's bloody good at contract law or any or, or arbitrations or whatever it is. I respect all of them. I have no problems. And I'm the last person to say that because I come from a certain place, therefore my side of the profession is better. I'm not going to make any of those statements. But it remains a reality that the influence that a powerful litigator commands, he's practically matchless compared to anybody else from the very same profession. There's a reason for it. Litigators and surgeons have specific, let's say, value additions, which are almost irreplaceable. Because it's not just what they bring to the table, but it's also who they are. And that's only possible through court. I have seen the finest of people who are great when it comes to uh, the corporate side realizing how that document can be unraveled by a litigator in court. I am partial to the profession or let's say the area of the profession I come from, but I have seen these realities objectively speaking. If you really aspire to have that kind of, let's say, command over the subject and also want doors opened, then litigation is the place to be. I will hard sell it like nobody's business, provided you're willing to do Sashtanga Namaskar to it. 100% surrender. It calls for submission. There is no democracy there. You must do whatever it takes. You will get to showcase your differentness or your out of the box thinking after having gone through the hoops, not at the outset. And the best part of litigation is it doesn't care for any law school brand. It has no respect for any law school brand at all. Because what a law school brand can create is initial interest. But once, let's say, the tire meets the ground and the rubber hits the ground, it's a question of performance. And then your degree is paid. So a lot of people actually go, they do their masters in the hope that the Oxford degree on their nameplate will actually translate to some kind of impact. It still hasn't translated to any impact in the Indian context yet. It makes an impact only in certain circumstances. when. If there's a particular specialization that you have come equipped with, which India is not in a position to offer yet. So for instance, IP taxation, IP valuation. These are specialized subjects where we still don't have enough programs in this country. There is a need from the uh, industry side, which the academia is not able to fulfill. And therefore, those degrees from outside make a huge difference. But outside of that, gone is the charm for the Oxford and the Harvard LLMs anymore. Nobody cares. And most of us have wisened to the fact that Indians are nothing but glorified, enticed, seduced cash cows for these universities so that they take your money from your LLM program and put it in the form of endowments for their JDs. And scholarships are created for the ones who study from the US. That I don't think what I would want to be subjected to. I don't want to be welcomed with neon signs with given an Indian welcome with garland and coconut water and everything only to know that my money is going to somebody else as opposed to me getting anything because there's no placement guarantee also after your LLM. So it's at best a glorified nine month vacation beyond a point for people who have the means. It's not even a full year, it's nine months. And mine is a middle class Indian brain. I'm paying for one year, I'm getting only nine months. <laughs> That's the bang for the buck I'll start looking for. Next. I think I may work. Yeah, it works. See, there's one point you spoke about which is on writing, which is a critical skill, but completely not given enough attention or training. It's the bane of accountants, and I'm sorry to say lawyers. I've read enough writings from the legal team, whether they're corporate transaction, judgments, arbitral awards, lawyers arguing cases, briefs. Frankly, it, it just 
miserable to read legal documents. So how does one start off with good writing? You know, writing to persuade, writing to convince, writing to overcome objections. So if you give certain tips, I think it'll help us, you know, uh, that's my view, because it's, because I believe writing is, it's a skill which I can still use. There are always good tips and you only get better at it the more you write. But now you have these specialized, I found to my horror, content creators. I, I frankly don't trust content creators because I write on forensics and many of my friends tell me, well, there'll be a content creator, pay them, you know, 5,000 rupees and they'll create the content. I, I don't think that model works. And then you balance it with 140 characters on Twitter. That How do you get to good writing? Now it's, I don't know, 250, whatever it is, you know, uh, 2 GB videos. Mm. Thank you. I have been accused of difficult writing in the first book myself. So I, uh, I'll just draw from that experience. Lawyers rarely write, they draft. And there's a huge difference. And for good measure and for good reason. <laughs> So let me explain how I would go about it. And I have to get into a bit of a nuance here. If I'm preparing a legal note for, let's say, an in-house counsel on a matter of taxation, over the years when I used to draft uh, advice and opinions as, as part of my briefing days, what I would do is the first is the non-negotiable legal jargon. I'll tell you why it has to be included. I'll explain that. And finally, is the simplest summary in terms of the way forward. And there's a reason. When you try and make it simple, unfortunately, still people assume it's a mark of lack of knowledge or it is lack of depth. Simplicity in communication is equated with shallowness and knowledge. There's a perceptional barrier there which we try to overcome. And jargon is a measure of knowledge apparently. This no single person can change without affecting his own fortunes in the legal profession. Because you know what? A prospective client who is shopping for options is not going to go to one lawyer alone. He's going to go to multiple lawyers. So he says, he's written it so simply. And the other fellow is bombarding him with language and so on and so forth. Tell me how in-house counsels operate. In-house counsels operate on making sure that their internal customers are satisfied first. Because that's who they are answerable to. And therefore, the more authentic sounding opinion is want to be placed before the internal audience. That's how the decisions are taken. Gradually, that there may be a change, but the de facto position, the norm is still this. So nobody is trying to improve their writing. They're all trying to cater to their existing realities. Nobody has an interest in improving their writing there. There is no incentive for that. You know when the incentive will actually start? And here it has to be a top-down percolation. When judgments stop quoting Justice Krishna a year for language, or trying to replicate him, because not everybody is a Justice Krishna here. Or when they start with Burton Russell, Thoru, where well you don't have any Indians to quote or cite or what? What is this dying need to quote people from both sides of the Atlantic? You've been independent for 75 years for God's sakes. Have some originality. And nobody is asking you to write a book, we are asking you to write a judgment. So come to the point quickly. The judgments that you go from, from either sides of the Atlantic run into 70 pages, even on the most constitutional of questions which go from reference from federal circuit to the Supreme Court. They can finish patent judgments in 70 pages, which is hardcore technology and law put together. We can't do that for other subjects. When judgment writing improves, a message is sent that this is meant to be more readable across the board. Obviously, this can't be done for subjects across the board because taxation is a different ball game. Hyper-specialized subjects and technical subjects are different. But at least in constitution, you make an effort to write something simple and relatable. This message has to come from the higher judiciary. So 
So if you want to take up writing lessons, you should go to academies, not to law schools. <laughs> Next. Say, query on commercial litigation. Picking up on the comment on in-house counsels. Right. As in-house counsels, we try to filter a lot of the litigation in terms of what really makes sense to go to court. So in your experience, what's the trend that you've seen of commercial contracts which actually reach trial courts, have the penchant to even appeal, go to high court and Supreme Court? That's one part of the question. Can you uh, rephrase the question a bit more? Tell me so the experience this is coming from. As in-house counsel, we try to cut down the number of litigations generally. Right. We balance in terms of what is the litigation cost, relationship between the parties, and a lot of things. Right. So at times, it remains a concern in our mind as to what type of actual commercial transactions are hitting the courts for right. litigation. Right, right. right. Because right. the learnings in terms of what is the judgment, how does it apply, what do we take back from them, Right. that has always been a loop. Right. So what is the trend of commercial litigation you have seen reaching the courts, right. and people, right. in fact, appealing and reaching the Supreme Court on the same matter? Right. Second part. Was there a face palm moment that you had in terms of when you are looking at the forensics of those particular commercial litigations that you branded organization, how could you get this so wrong in your operations? Mm. And third... Uh, you mean the client or the law firm? The way the commercial contract, the parties to the commercial contract could not really get those right. nuances right. You wouldn't expect this from right. such a big brand to have done such a basic mistake. Uh, good question. <laughs> and the last one. Right. My general comment on commercial contact lawyers is they focus a lot more on theory, dots and dashes, I've gotten a great indemnity, so happy about it. But as a litigating counsel, when things go to the court, is there any advice to the commercial transaction lawyers that guys focus on this rather than something else? So I'll try to roll these into one. So one, um, big entities are great fans of processes. But when they create such an elaborate process, there is also a huge room for slip through the cracks. And there is also an unfortunate tendency in terms of having multiple points of answerability. That's obviously human psychology at play. But the litigation reality is either the record is not clean enough for the matter to be taken to court or sometimes there is a fix of getting conflicting signals from within the same entity. That has actually happened. Three, there have been these FOPA moments where you end up wondering how did this brand make is such a mistake when it has had a specialized team sitting for this very reason, for this particular area. There I actually assume that what happens is as an organization grows, it is, it is intent on creating a process as opposed to focusing on human intervention. I've seen this happen way too often. Startups or even mid-sized entities are sharper when it comes to litigation and are more willing to out-of-the-box litigation strategies, which are risky. Obviously, because they don't have a name to lose yet. So brands take certain decisions where the brand image sometimes overshadows legal strategy. It eclipses legal strategy significantly. And where they should actually concede and cut their losses and walk out, they make it an ego business. We can't be seen as walking out of this litigation through a concession. In the process, they hurt themselves even more in court by embarrassing themselves. So brand consciousness and litigation realities seldom go hand in hand. Two, uh, after the coming into force of the Commercial Courts Act, obviously there is a huge spurt. But the unfortunate reality is the coming into the Commercial Courts Act has not translated to greater speed in disposal at all. It's been, the ordinance came out in 2015, the act came out in 2016, we're in the seventh year right now, I'd say the eighth year of the trial. I haven't seen too many people actually expediting the process. What are the benefits under the Commercial Courts Act? Case management hearing has been 
provided for, which means if a party wants to present 10 witnesses to prove its case, the judge gets to ask, why 10 witnesses? Come down to three or four at best, explain what is it that each witness is going to talk on. I am not going to let you protect this trial for long. Two, oral submissions can be uh, time bound. Excessive focuses on written submissions. These are actually good practice. Because I don't see the point of treating courts as a place where a lawyer falls in love with his own voice. You have to quickly come to the point. Three, the brilliant option of providing for summary judgments in commercial courts. And also making it so moto, where a court actually believes that even if the parties don't agree, or even if one of the party doesn't agree, I believe there's a case made out for so moto so summary judgment. These are great aspects. Then serious proscriptions and discouragement of filing documents until the last minute. I still haven't seen too much of emphasis on its enforcement. So nobody can come and tell me that there is a lacuna in the written letter of the law where it comes to expeditious disposal of commercial litigation. No, it exists. The law exists. But the culture hasn't changed yet. Also because which litigating lawyer will have the incentive to jump for a summary judgment when he can make more through the trial? That's where in-house counsels will have to step into the picture and start asking these questions. You have this option. Explain to me why do I need to suffer this litigation for five years when I can see this one way or the other in maybe one, one, one and a half years at best. Maybe in-house counsels have their own compulsions. I'm not, I don't know. I leave it at that. Three, um, what suggestion would you have for a transaction lawyer based on litigation experience? Um, I had the, the good fortune and the bad fortune of doing a litigation in the Hanover District Court against Continental, which manufactures these tires, the German major, for an Indian startup, which was asserting its copyright over its enterprise resource planning software, ERP software. Guess what? The matter was finished on day one, and we lost on day one, and that was the end of it. Because the way they read contracts and the way we read contracts are very different. And I think it's got to do a lot more with theological background and cultural, uh, let's say, background. I'll explain why. Their reading of the contract is, if the language says this, I have no room for play in between. It's like reading the Bible or the Quran. That's what I'm trying to tell you. This is where it stops. It's literalist, practically. But the Indian brain looks for all kinds of middle paths. So we were being hyper creative in our interpretation of the contract. Only to realize German says, sorry, cold blooded German interpretation at play. Show me where is this? It, uh, it's not there. That's the end of the matter. That's it. Thrown out on day one. And when the other aspect also is that district happens to be the place where the organization has its headquarters. There is also that angle there. The protectionism that we accuse Indian courts of is actually to be found in Western courts more for their own entities. So the lesson then in some of the advice that are given for contra contract drafting after that experience was, now if you see the Supreme Court jurisprudence on contract interpretation, it's going closer to the literalist interpretation, which is to say the court cannot read into the contract what does not exist and what has not been provided for, despite the best of its intentions. You cannot go beyond the intention of the parties as reflected by the language of the contract, period. That's the evolving law. So before the Supreme Court started saying this seriously, so there was a recent judgment of Justice Narsimha which came out in 2022, where it's a fantastic summary of the evolution of Indian contract jurisprudence. Before that, we had started, I had already started telling people, if you mean something, say it. Don't leave it to imagination of the parties. Because what courts, so what is it that the courts are trying to do? It's not principle of contract jurisprudence that they're evolving. It's the principle of convenience that they're evolving. Which is to say, if, if I can actually deal with it through an express provision, why are you putting me through the hoops of having to go through the surrounding factual matrix, the emails exchanged? the intention of the contract, the purpose of the contract. All of that you provide for in the contract itself, make it a self-contained document. Don't force me to look for any development outside of it. That I think is, is the gradual way forward. Um, but this is of course coming from a person who knows how to break a document, not to make a document.
I am not in the business of putting a document together if it's a contract document. So that's the difference. You're talking to a sword, not a shield. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. I'm not from legal uh, side. I'm a finance faculty. But listening to your uh, important advice for the law schools, uh, especially about the tech, tech savvy importance as well as the AI, in the last few months, I've been interacting with uh, these AI tools okay. as part of my teaching. And uh, I'm getting a lot of inputs, and that facilitates my teaching and as well as my learning. And when do you think that there will be a kind of a virtual lawyer that the AI can produce? Let's say that you put all your case to the AI tool and what kind of arguments you want to do in the court. And the AI tool can the ins the itself can argue and the case. It's not far up because in many areas right, where we see observed AI, recently just now today I observed, AI is able to uh, go beyond space explorations. In fact, it's not just kind of a prediction or kind of a forecasting. Right, right. And uh, in the especially in legal area, let's say you put one case, uh, what are all the facts and all the things. The A can come with all kinds of arguments. And a big law firm that has got tech, tech advantage can use this technology. And that is one area. The other area, how come the the court or the judiciary, the judges, can scale up to this technology in case if a couple of law firms can scale up to the technology, they can use the technology to uh, bring up the arguments better. Will the judiciary or the judges can match the speed of this technology? So these are all the two questions. So you see, one of the things that we sometimes tend to forget when it comes to, let's say, delivery of a product or rendition of a service is liability. Assume for a moment that you outsource the entire thing to AI. So where is the service liability here? Who are you going to hold responsible in case there's a negligence? I'm still making room for negligence even if it happens to be AI because it's still not perfect yet. Right? So are you going to blame a machine for the decisions that you take? Service liability is a huge aspect of these considerations. Because what is the practical question that you're asking? What does it boil down to? Will AI be given statutory recognition under the Advocates Act? That is the actual question, right? No, no, I understand, I understand. So I understand, I completely understand what you're saying. See, here's what I think. What is it that AI can do, which we can do at this stage? and where we are replaceable, where we are obsolete. Simplifying research to a significant extent, preparing a basic draft, right? Or even in preparation of judgments, let's hope that we have a situation where the factual matrix is provided or written submissions of both sides are actually fed. And then at the very least, you have a basic draft. But the end mile, the last mile, will still have to be from the human side, right? Now, why AI is useful there is, uh, Here's the practical consequence. There is a power of review that is provided in most courts, wherein if there is a patent error or a manifest error where either a factual element has been missed out or has been misappreciated, you get to move an application to ask the very same person to review and say, please revisit. But the grounds are very limited. AI can be used to reduce these repetitions from the perspective of having all facts being considered, the outcome, of course, in terms of what it must be uh, or what it must lead to will be left to the human mind. So the possibility is increasing the pace at which you actually churn out documents. But the value addition will continue to be in your hands still. Now, for instance, uh, I'm in the process of writing my third book. So what I did was I actually used ChatGPT for a particular portion, just to see what AI, it, uh, sorry, what research it throws up. 
unbelievably horrible some of them because ai at least chat gpt is still drawing its sources from wikipedia now there are two problems with wikipedia one not all citations are let's say credible second it has been established that there is an ideological bias in wikipedia pages so i can't even rely on it think of ai as merely a processing medium because it doesn't generate information it falls back on existing portals which have the information that error will be reflected here so perhaps what i'm arguing against is treating ai output as god speak even with respect to facts forget outcome and the area or aspect of history that i was hoping to get information from is a well documented aspect which is the sanyasi rebellion of 1763 for another 38 years which happened in bengal enough literature that exists my research team and i pulled out better literature than what was cited by chat gpt so what i did was i asked the red team to go through the chat gpt route i asked the blue team to look at it through actual documents the best of the documents cited and pulled out by the blue team were not even reflected in chat gpt when the timelines were wrong so there is still some way so we still have some breathing space but even then i still don't think there is a substitute for human intervention or human intuition for that matter which is the key element there may be an element uh, sorry there may be a substitute for human intellect but not intuition intuition is extremely different the day ai can rep- uh, let's say replicate intuition we have done away with the concept of god <laughs> because intuition is what makes us different it's not intellect every species has its own degrees of intellect depending on its evolutionary journey but what makes you different is the x factor and the x factor is intuition and that x factor leads you in the direction of depth of consciousness not to the mind not to the foregro- let's say the foreground mind it goes to the deep recesses and to create that will require a huge leap of cognitive abilities and understanding of cognitive abilities you may know so most of us have when it comes to most of these sciences a clear answer as to the how we don't have answers to the why we don't have answers to the why even in the best of fields why something happens you don't know take a look at your let's say the manner in which you create a molecule for any particular condition you are focusing on creating statistical data to show replicability through clinical trials because you are only focusing on the how if you knew the why you don't need the clinical trials at all because then you ha- you actually have the the prime cause answer i therefore while ai will make uh, lives easy and miserable in different ways i don't think it's going to be able to replace the all important element of intuition why should or what let's say case uh, qualifies as the rarest of rarest cases for application of the capital punishment obviously ai cannot determine that people want marital rape to be recognized within the bounds of the law i would challenge ai to tell me how do you demonstrate rape within the confines of a marital institution it's as good or as bad as trying to prove an oral contract with no witness to an oral contract so there are serious rooms where which expose the limitation for ai think of ai as advanced glorified documenting ability at least in its uh, alpha version let's see what the beta says and i would want to wait and see the direction in which it moves coming to whether it can help judges as i said 100% it can in at least preparing a basic draft because most of the time what happens is as a as someone who also moonlights as an author i can say this it's not the writing part the problem is to begin to write starting problem you need a kick to actually set the ball rolling and start the process and this is something that judges have said very often so you usually what happens is after judgments are reserved sometimes we don't get the verdicts for 8 months 9 months because either they have their hands full or what not so what do you do you go and mention we not we had argued this before so is there a possibility they say we already have so many judgments piled up that we have to sit and write so we haven't even either started writing or what not which is legitimate concern 
because you see in countries like singapore and other places for each million capacity they seem to have 10 judges and that too for a city state like singapore is good we don't have that kind of capacities yet right for a size uh, for a country of the population of india the size of the judiciary is actually less and they are understaffed when they set up the madurai bench or let's say of the uh, of the chennai high of the madras high court and they built the new building the buildings were there people were in there it took them a lot of time to populate the place with judges so the these are the let's say the areas where i would say that ai can genuinely make itself useful in a good way to speed up uh, the process and to expedite the process next yes sir Hmm. Okay, that's one. And Correct. From a tax angle, that's what I've been. In fact, this to add yeah. to your point, yeah. Yeah. what also happens is, usually a judge is not allowed to undertake his own research, either on facts or even on law, because even if you do your own research. you have an obligation to confront both parties with the judgment that you intend to cite or place reliance on by and large because then parties have an opportunity to explain why the judgment is applicable irrelevant or can be distinguished on facts so by and large what is it that judges fall back on the assistance provided by councils right what ai can do is on a particular area it can finish the research giving the judges more ammunition than the convenient research that either side is presenting so okay. and then giving the judges an opportunity to confront them with the judg judgments they never cited in the first place this uh, there are two reasons for this either on the constitutional front or even on the uh, civil commercial front we have the concept of per incurium that is a judgment which has been passed in ignorance of a previous judgment on the very same issue those are the redundancies that ai can brilliantly plug that i would agree with thank you sir good morning sir good morning my Namaste. name is abhyuday and i am in third year of my bba llb course yes please. and uh, my question um, i have two questions basically the first one is that uh, there are certain departments certain areas okay. under the ambit of government of india and certain cr certain areas which are not practiced by hardcore lawyers right they are being practiced by ca cs or many other other technical aspect people who are who are com coming up over the cat and all right like if i give example there are transfer pricing cases significant economic presence cases Correct. international taxation patent cases. office oppositions are argued by patent agents yeah. you don't need lawyers for it so there are many more departments which are having only 1% of lawyers interaction and since my first year of my law school i have been doing this articles writing blogs and verdictum and many more blogs which are well renowned in the nature right so i think that if i want to start a career in those less opened up field so what all aspect should i keep in mind and how to proceed with it and i have a second follow up question i'll ask so what i have seen and this is a very nascent fledgling trend so there was a time and there continues to be a time where a lot of company secretaries also take up llb degrees i am seeing the reverse happening now in major law schools wherein people with integrated programs realizing that they need hardcore commercial exposure outside of the law on the accountancy side and so on and so forth are doing company secretaryships also or even ca i'd say that's a fantastic way of doing it i'd say that's a great combination uh, some of the finest judges on the commercial side of the delhi high court are previously chartered accountants ah okay fine then it seems like i've read the trend right so yeah. <laughs> and this started with some of my own law school juniors from my law school who were engineers who were pursuing their law and then started doing a company secretary also so i think that's that's the way of being a step ahead of the crowd simply because it uh, adds more value to your degree what's the point of doing a business law without even understanding how accounting works those are or what is the concept of an accounting standard how does this work exactly particularly when it comes down to a point in arbitrations and other places where you are falling back on arguments relating to accounting standards auditing what not this happens so often which is why i said the way to make law or the program more useful 
is to think of it like a transformer where you push in more material from other fields so that there is more value addition to every law that you read because you're only reading the law relating to a particular transaction without any first hand knowledge of how the transaction works like what's your follow up yeah. and uh, adding on to that as i i myself am pursuing cs executive as well so i know those prospects which you told right and uh, secondly my question which is not related to this thing is uh, you talked you talked about writing content right. or ma majorly writing or drafting and then reading blogs and website and many more things right so there is a very hairline difference between misinformation and spreading of hatred or own opinion hmm. like we have the right to express ourselves from the fundamental rights right. but there is a very hairline difference between right. spe the spreading of hatred and spreading of misinformation right. which one of our delegates have already told about the content creators which are present on social media platforms nowadays right. second year first year law students are telling how to get bail under 438 and 439 right. they are talking about anticipatory bail whether they don't even know that anticipation or anticipatory is not even the word which is in the bail act right so how to identify those hairlines hairline gap the parity and exploit them in the court of law as being a litigator after 2 years like i will be in my 5th year 6th year then i want to do this thing. so what all aspect i should explain the uh, circumstance you are actually dealing with i am not able to wrap my head around all right. explain so i'll come up again right there are many content creators who are not qualified okay who are under qualified under knowledgeable right but having a great account of audience okay so they are spreading up misinformation understood and there is a second class of content creators huh. who are spreading hatred and spreading their own opinions on that particular matter okay theek okay. hai i won't take the name but there are many channels many social media profiles who mm. are doing these things right so how to take up a difference and how to proceed with this loophole of law that which which is having no regulation on these things it's as good or as bad as asking how do you plug fake news i'm sorry yeah, yeah. but see uh, the question is which serious in house counsel or litigator is reading up these portals to actually gather or glean information i would judge the person actually because garbage will continue to be produced but whether you have the vivek or not to actually understand what is gold and what is garbage is a function of the barometer within your own head space okay look at it you are not going to be able to control the supply side beyond a point in terms of the content that's created it's only going to increase because content creation has become the new job filler those who don't have any other skill sets to offer they become content creators i'm not accusing most people i'm saying by and large i've seen this happen you know why uh journalism degrees are producing more content creators than journalists that is a fact nobody is actually taking up these mass communication degrees to come out with ground reporting or anything they are becoming content creators because it's soft it's easy you don't need to go and bite the dust you can do this from the confines of your home all you need is an internet connection and a laptop that's it you don't even need to be qualified in the particular subject i'll give you a comparable example from the legal fraternity oh, sorry from the medical fraternity we are producing too many mbbs without being able to accommodate them you know what is the fight that's going on so for clinical subjects such as pharmacology where you don't need an mbbs degree but you actually need a specialized knowledge of clinical subjects or sorry they are called non clinical subjects the push over the last 3 years from the government side has been to remove those with non mbbs degrees but specializations here to accommodate the underemployed mbbs so when you go to a path lab the report comes out there are two levels of let's say diagnostics first is the clinical report and the second is a uh, the medical diagnosis which the mbbs doctor will do now they are actually saying the person who signs on the report to see if the parameters are met and the report is made properly or not will also have to be a person who who has an mbbs degree now you are telling me that this is actually necessary all these years you have been doing this without knowing what they what they are talking about no you are accommodating people who are you are producing in surplus the interesting part is these qualifications in terms of the non mbbs specialists have been heads of departments of medical departments for decades in colleges not just in this country across the world why all these areas were beneath the dignity of doctors all these years 
and therefore they would not actually find people with MBBS qualifications to occupy this position. So therefore to fill that gap for decades governments have been pushing people from the clinical side to occupy this. Now you have too many doctors who don't have jobs. So they're saying kick these people out. I'm actually fighting this life battle before the Delhi High Court. The worst part is despite let's say a shortage of people to do this and MBBS being produced the number of MBBS who are opting for these kind of specializations is lower than the number of non-MBBS clinical degrees who are actually going for it. What I'm perhaps trying to say is this is what happens when there is no systematic let's say planning with respect to how many people of a particular qualification do we need in a country. A country with too many lawyers is bad. A country with too many people who are financial experts is bad. A country with too many people who are in the tertiary sector is terrible. Because you are seeing the live example of that in the form of United States, which has eroded its manufacturing capabilities completely, focuses on becoming the capital, let's say, uh, market, let's say the epicenter of, of finances, uh, financial services in the world. And now it doesn't know how to even produce a battery and finds itself entirely dependent on a trade adversary such as China. Take away the financial district of London and you will see UK crumble within months. Today it has, UK survives only on two aspects, I'd say broadly three. One, it is the safe haven for all white capital crooks because of their extradition rules. Two, financial services, London continues to be an important center. Three, tourism. Beyond that, they have nothing to offer. Really nothing to offer. So, in the age of social media democratization of opinion, where every Tom, Dick and Harry feels the need to say something because he thinks he knows something and he also has the tools on his handset, not anymore on, on let's say on your laptop to push out that information. The consumer is, is expected to be wiser, not the content creator. The burden has shifted. There are no liability rules here. The only thing that you at least hope is when he co comes out with an article, he at least says, I am just a student, at least make that fair disclosure. Or whether you have a degree or not, say that at the bottom so that we know how much of stock to put into your opinion or not. There is no legal, uh, let's say, uh, remedy for this. Not happening. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. How many more questions shall we take, sir? Hello. Uh, so it's 1.20. We can take until 1.30. Yeah, sure. Because I don't see the point in overseeing my welcome. <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. Yes, my yes. name is Yashwan Thredi. Yes. I'm a fourth year law student and, and I'm Bangalore. Uh, so I have two, three questions. The first one is uh, how, why is there a lack of integration of technology in the legal industry, be it in any aspect, be it a commercial law firm or be it a, you know, an independent litigator practice or be it large regulatory compliance service organizations or mm any other anywhere else the uh, right now we are situated in bangalore right this is the epicenter of innovation we are seeing startups which are delivering products at a scale and cost which is unheard of we are competing with israel we are competing with singapore and uh, i genuinely am a believer in the idea of this is india's coming of age why is the legal industry lagging behind? Why is it not catching the so legal, ban uh, the technology bandwagon as it is supposed to? Let me answer each question separately. So this is your first question? Yes. Right, okay. So first, that trend is actually changing. I can say this for a fact. It, it is changing uh, from case updates to integration softwares in terms of maintaining their own portfolios to understand what is the deadline to be met for a particular filing of a written statement and all that. That's happening. That's actually happening. Right. The pace may be a bit of an issue only because you see, by and large, the fraternity has been filled with people who have taken law as a way out of tech related qualifications. When that composition has changed, automatically you will find people. So in my generation at least and even before that, in, in the cities we come from, law never figured in the, feature in, in the list of priority options for anyone who is good at MPC, Maths, Physics and Chemistry. It wouldn't, right? I'm saying it's actually unfortunate because it's a beautifully logical subject which requires actual argumentation and reason. I don't believe that law is meant for the refuse of MPC. 
I would actually say the best of brains must come here. No wonder tertiary degree holders of sciences take up JD in other countries because they realize how serious the profession is. When there are liabilities, there are malpractice insurances and whatnot, imagine the extent of obligation. It is only in this country that within five years you become a lawyer and you enter the court immediately. You go to Germany or you go to Singapore and other places, you have to really bust it for seven years at the very least to prove yourself before you think you can enter the court. What is the consequence? Everybody who walks to court these days is neither prepared with a file nor with a submission. And most of the time it's spent only in seeking adjournments. Whereas there they go to court, finish. It's a rocket docket. You finish it quickly. I was telling somebody that the US Supreme Court takes up oral submissions only twice or thrice a year. The rest of the time it is focused. Start, it's almost like an election bash and goes on and on and on, endless. So I think it's a function of the changing profile of the legal professionals themselves. And when they know for a fact that these are the basic tech expectations or infrastructural expectations from the clients, that push is also coming their way. So it's not just about plush offices anymore. It's more about how tech savvy you are on two fronts. Is the office green? Is the office tech savvy? Period. So I think there is obviously more room for improvement here, but it is nevertheless happening. So much so that as you said, even individual litigators have started going for these uh, legal tech softwares. That's going on. I'm certainly positive about it. Next. Second, sir. So uh, I'm also very keenly interested and keep following up the management trends. Like, uh, as in how the business landscape is changing, right. how the regulatory landscape is changing, how some of the growing areas right now in India, we're seeing a huge capex push, we're seeing infrastructure being built everywhere, we are seeing investments as the West and UK, as you have pointed out, right. is going through what's an economic slowdown. Right. Historically, whenever this has happened, India has benefited out of it. Right. People say that 2008 is a very bad year for US, but in fact, for India, it's great. Cities like Bangalore, Hyderabad, Gurgaon, Mumbai, cities where the 40% of our urban population is going through. Understood. Right? Uh, by a large a meta idea of all of these things going on and us consuming this fast-paced growth, we often find ourselves with ideas and In the interest of time, come to the question. We often find ourselves with ideas mm. and thoughts mm. which might be uh, some s which might give certain solutions. Similarly, I uh, was able to deduce that since you have a huge background in insolvency, sir, so no, why no. are uh, we still relying upon newspaper publications by the resolution professionals? Why isn't there a more open, matlab, technology leverage platform? Got your point. I wouldn't answer the question for one reason. I am not an expert in insolvency. I don't have a huge background in insolvency. As an arguing counsel, I argue matters relating to insolvency. There's okay. a huge difference, okay? okay? So if you were to ask me if it's your core area of competence, I'd say no. But is it your core area of practice? I'd say yes. There's a difference. Yes. Sir. Which is Thanks. it's not something that I issue advice on on a regular basis. What is expected of me as an arguing counsel is to be master of some jack of all, right? So which means the plane hits the uh, hits the tarmac, I get a call saying, sir, you have to appear in this matter, here's the note, here, and briefings go on, on online when you're on the way to court, you go there, and because of your uptake speed, and because you do this day in and day out, you quickly start firing the moment you go to court. That doesn't make me an insolvency expert. So right. there's a difference here. So I am not going to answer this question as if I'm some kind of an insolvency professional or remotely an expert. This is the difference between a solicitor and a barrister or an arguing counsel. If you were to ask me questions relating to, let's say, uh, constitution or intellectual property for that matter, or competition law for that matter, my response time will be faster when it comes to the nuts and bolts of it. Insolvency, I wouldn't dare to answer the question and insult the people who do it day in and, do it day, in and day out. I won't do that. Next. Uh, okay, sir. So, so, uh, picking up on one of your things, pharma, is pharma and life sciences post-COVID. Right has also seen an explosive growth in India. Right. And it is stem for, uh, and it is stemmed for a larger growth. And IP certainly plays a huge relevance and a right. lot of opportunities to grow there. Uh, what do you think at me, I'm in my fourth year. Let's say, however, like you, uh, I was also a mechanical engineer. I dropped out of Vasavi and I came here. And- uh, Hyderabad. Hyderabad. Sir. Right. So I completely resonate with your ideology of how law helps us, how the depth of the knowledge we can get through and the perfection 
right. we can attain is far more superior, I believe, right. than other pursuits which give us an intellectual pleasure. So if I want to let per, per se have a, a piece of the pharma industry, I right. want to work with clients mm. who like biologically, like innovative clients, clients right. who are making strides across the globe. What should I be looking at? So one of the things that, so let's get down to the specifics. Um, obviously two legislations, one is the Drugs and Cosmetics Act, along with the Drug Pricing Control Order. Yes. Then the manner in which the National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority works, right? Then you have to understand the value chain. Right. Sir. In terms of the clearing agents, the CNF agents, how do they operate? Then uh, how is title transferred from a pharmaceutical entity to its distributors and then to the retailer? Those questions are very, very crucial, particularly when you are looking at uh, injunctions and whatnot. Three, Indian uh, pharmaceutical companies are still not in the business of coming out with blockbuster molecules yet because of the prohibitive costs involved. The inflated cost which we are usually told by a study by I think the Tufts University is it takes anywhere between 800 million dollars to a billion to produce one good molecule and close to about 40 to 50 percent of it is subsidized by the US government. I don't see that push coming either from the Indian government or the private sector. So the Indian pharmaceutical sector, barring one or two entities, are largely generics. Now previously the model was to bust and use, which is kill the patent and use the product, or wait for the patent to, uh, the drug to go off patent. Now the licensing model has come into picture because even MNCs and innovators have realized that there's a way of coexisting. Right. Their strength lies in manufacturing, our strength lies in innovation. Why don't we collaborate? This is happening in two spaces. Why don't you have Nokia phones anymore or Sony phones anymore or Ericsson, Ericsson phones anymore? Because they've gone to the higher value chain which is standard essential patents. They create technology, create technology standards and they limit themselves at best to the first place where the technology is implemented which is base station equipment, which is the towers and the control rooms behind. Then comes the lowest value chain which is the handset. It's not even the high end of the value chain. Right? The base station equipment is giga giga tons in terms of the money involved. This is really nothing. This is peanuts. That's why Indians are paying <laughs> attention to this yet because we don't have the ability. We are not even manufacturing phones by the way. We are getting CKDs which is completely knocked down kits from China. Yes. We put it together and we call it Make in India. Okay. Assembled this is our manufacturing ability because we get tax ops for it. So you set up a place where you simply bring down stuff and you put it together. But if you were to ask to manufacture, none of these people actually manufacture the chip. They don't. Because the chip is where the technology is. Yes. Sir. Okay. So in this industry too, what has happened is they have shut shop when it comes to mobile phones. And we have taken over when it comes to mobile phones. Now gradually from here, we have to go up. I see a better movement on the pharma front than on the telecom front. Micromax is almost gone. All those entities which were in mm -hmm. vogue between 2013 to 14 to 15, it's gone because the industry has seen negative consolidation, largely because of standard essential patent litigation. On the pharma front, in the on the contrary, some of the entities like Natco, DRL, Sun Pharma have done a fabulous job of exposing the the evergreening monopolistic tendencies of pharmaceutical majors. Yes, sir. And I'm very proud of it. I can confidently say that having been part of these matters as their lead counsels, I've thoroughly enjoyed giving them a run for their money. And the way they actually take people for a ride across the world is unbelievable. It's truly unbelievable. You should read some of the reports that have come from the European Director General on antitrust issues with respect to the monopolistic practices of pharmaceutical companies. Then you ask yourself, what is this bubble that you live in? Yes. For the first time, I think the whole world was forced to revisit this during this vaccination game. Those people who were branded as conspiracy job nuts when, when it comes to vaccination were proven right ultimately. Yes, sir. If someone tells me, go take a booster dose, I'll die <laughs> rather than taking a booster dose. I am not going to do it ever again. <laughs> Everyone who has taken vaccination is prone to more cold. Latent uh, conditions have come out. God knows what it is going to do to the next generation should you choose to have kids. I have no idea. So. The myopic view is that the Indian genetic industry is doing well. The macroscopic view is that you need very serious alternatives to 
modern allopathic healthcare. That's where the push is. Thank you, sir. Hello, sir. So, sir. Yeah, yeah, please. So, sir, my question is regarding during the talk of discussion, you were talking about the you compared basically the foreign courts, basically the U.S. court and the Indian courts in terms of speedy disposal of cases. When we talk about the speedy disposal, we keep. No, no, I'm not saying U.S. is better. Please don't mind. No, because please, the please reason just is Indians are actually litigious much more than we give ourselves credit for. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry lands in court, and the number of matters that go to courts on a daily basis, no court in the world actually gets it. So yeah, go on. Please. So, sir, my uh, question is: so in the terms of spe speedy disposal, if we talk about, so there are th three to four trending laws in commercial litigation. If we see, first is arbitration, second is real disputes, third is insolvency law. Right. But all, if we talk about the arbitration law, it is totally weak. We are referring to judgments, not the Bear Act, Bear Act first, because the Bear Act weak in, in terms of foreign enforcement of foreign awards. Mm. If we talk about the Section 34, uh, Section 34 for application for settings uh, aside, right. we refer to Justice Rohinder Nariman judgments. We refer to Justice Chandrachur cases and right. multiple high courts because. There are, time, there are times when IBC Arbitration Act, which is very silent on the aspect of law, how to deal with, but the cases right, are right, there. Right. And there are times when the court, their court is coming with something new, like the, the new case on the unstamped duty case of the arbitration agreement. Correct. And there were multiple constitutional cases already on that it can be allowed, it cannot be allowed. Right, and right. now the court said it cannot be allowed. So right. there is a multiverse dispute regarding the issues of law because the law is silent, but the judgments are there. So. If we talk about the speedy disposal, but they are not speedy arbitration, insolvency, or RERA disputes. We have RERA tribunals also. Right. For insolvency, we said insol uh, you need to follow these processes. But people have go gone to NCLT and they break through the law and they follow some other procedure, Correct. which is more time taking. We s the legislature said it was not uh, speedy, but it is not. So, right. what's your view on this? <coughs> so, if there is a right of appeal, and it's not an unqualified right of appeal, rather it's not a qualified right of appeal. You can't fault parties for doing what is in their best interest, as long as it is traceable to a statutory provision. Now, if it falls upon, I think, evolving principles of thresholds by appellate courts, saying we will interfere or we will not interfere beyond this point. So, uh, for a good 25 to 30 years, in my home territory, so to speak, IP, the bulk of the litigation was fought only on interim injunctions. Until the Supreme Court said, what is this? We seem to be finding only interim disputes coming up on the IP front. We don't see final jurisprudence coming out. So then I think in the Intex versus Aqua case, the court went on to say, no, we need some principles here. Don't interfere if the view taken is one of the plausible views in the facts of the case, just because you disagree with it. That has happened. Gradually, I see this happening on the Section 34 front in arbitration. Now, IBC, the principle that the court has evolved is if the committee of creditors takes a particular decision, which is commercial in nature, either in the best interest of the company or for liquidation, the NCLT will not interfere with that particular decision. So not every subjective commercial decision will be the subject of judicial review is the, is the position that's being taken. So what are they trying to say? At some stage, the process must have finality. And when in insolvency, the committee of creditors has access to the financial health of the company, the availability of somebody to buy the company or to step into the shoes of the company to run it, when these people have taken a conscious decision, unless you can prove that they are in cahoots with uh, another party or there is a serious violation of principles of national justice, don't get into the picture. Also realize that IBC is relatively recent. You have moved from SICA jurisprudence to IBC jurisprudence. And winding up litigation still is going on in several company benches. I should know this because when, when you appear in those matters, you're actually dealing with matters which are 25, 30, 40 years old. Companies are not yet bound up. It's as good or as bad as saying in human terms that the man is dead and they're allowing the body to decompose for 25 years without actually burning the damn thing or whatever religion you follow, of course. So considering that, uh, the message needs to come, and again, how will you come to this message? Go to the Supreme Court any day. Sit before any bench. Just watch. Close to 75 to 80 matters are disposed of in 30 minutes. You know why? 
because the court is only saying you can't come to the supreme court for this you can't come to the supreme court for this go back go back go back when the supreme court says we are a constitutional court we are not a court of appeal then appellate court will take the same position and give respect to trial courts when trial courts are given the respect that they deserve both by the parties as well as by appellate courts is when the buck stops somewhere the difference between us and india is not the difference between us supreme court and indian supreme court it is the difference between us trial courts and indian trial courts nobody wants to litigate complex matters before indian trial courts they are looking for high courts with original jurisdiction because they assume that's the only court that can relate to the the savvy nature of the matter or the complex nature of the matter how many people in this country have the guts to fight a patent litigation in a gurgaon district court or in the city civil court of bangalore i have argued a, uh, an ip matter here way back in 2013 14 before the city civil court of bangalore what a brilliant judge brilliant it was absolute pleasure arguing this before city civil courts and younger blood is entering the trial side on the judicial side the message that i think we can send as a fraternity is by saying go to that court don't exaggerate the value of your case just to come to the high court go and litigate there and you know why it's good actually there are not too many matters before district courts of this nature across the country you will actually get a faster outcome from district courts than in high court because everybody is rushing to the high court so we have tried some of these strategies in different places a legal system that does not respect its trial court system which is the first trier of facts is standing on weak wicket on sticky wicket because the attention is on building the muscle building the upper chest building the uh, the back and everything but there is no leg day here to put it in workout terms that the legs are weak that you skip the leg day you go for, you go for the push day the pull day hit and everything else but you don't focus on leg and you're standing on it if you want fast track courts and everything that has to happen at the trial court level only what are the decisions that we rely upon when it comes to us decisions on patents district court of delaware the uh, district court of uh, southern district court of new york california these are the places we are not looking at us supreme court decisions and who is referring to that our high courts are referring to district court decisions of other countries <laughs> we are not even looking at their counterparts in terms of Uh, stature they're going down respect the first trier of facts as much as possible the trigger happy nature when it comes to appellate remedies will come down but there are such cases where you need to have appellate remedies criminal law is an example there because a lot of things can happen at the trial level the more you strengthen that process how many people want to apply for research positions or clerkships or researcherships in trial courts ask it from a very honest perspective even in your own law school you want a supreme court clerkship or researchership or the high court because that opens doors for llms or a law firm can you go to a district court and do this the supreme court or high court only exactly you want that culture let it start here law schools must actually tie up with district courts for two reasons show students what is trial court practice and two that's where the law is made so send them to assist the judges there because they don't have the budgets to actually engage researchers they don't have the money for it i know several judges who pay out of their own pockets to engage people to assist them with research you guys can do go ahead do it you learn over and out thank you Well, that was a great session, and uh, I'm sure everyone in the audience is going to take back a few things to think about today from here, ensuring that the narrative doesn't end here. Uh, on that note, on behalf of our deputy director, Dr. Narayani, the placement cell, and the School of Law at NMIMS Bengaluru, I extend heartfelt gratitude to Mr. J. Sai Deepak for agreeing to honor us with his presence here today. and addressing our audience about uh, the importance of value addition and the upcoming realities of the profession thank you sir our gratitude is also due to mr prasanna 
whose vision for the LRT and SOL Bengaluru made this event a reality. Thank you, sir. Also, the entire NMIMS management, we are very thankful for your constant support in making these visions for such endeavors a reality. Thank you. Before we formally close the session today, last but not the least, our uh, participants, my worthy colleagues, faculty members, and students, thank you for being a wonderful audience. I would like to request Mr. Eklavya to kindly present a token of regard to our guests for the day. I request everyone in the audience to kindly stand up for the national anthem. I request the audience to please continue standing so that we can take a group photograph uh, 